One more regular limit here. So we're using our limit rules explicitly. So I will use the first rule. I'm going to rewrite this. So this is actually a power, even though it's in disguise. So x approaches negative 2. This is 4x squared minus 3 to the half power. So I'm going to use that half power and bring it outside the limit. So that's our power law right there. So the limit of something to the half power is the limit of the thing raised to the half power. So this is a very easy limit to find. All you gotta do is put it in that x value basically. So that's 16 minus 3, 13. So there is our limit value. So you basically have everything you need to write down the rule for polynomials and rational functions and limits. We did some right here. So we just did a uh, rational function in the previous example right here. And I'm circling. That was a rational function. And same thing, polynomials. We did a polynomial on the first example here. So we know polynomials and rational functions have very nice limit laws. You basically just have to plug them in. So these are more limit laws. So we'll have p of x will be a polynomial. Oh, A is a bad letter to use. I'm already using it. Let's go with, did I use C before? Yep, we'll go with C. That works. All right, so if you have a polynomial, you can just plug in that limit value. That's all it takes in a polynomial. Just plug in that limit value. Yeah, in this case, there's not necessarily, I mean, there's, I'd have to do a lot, well, there's not going to be a hole at negative 2, because I actually basically plugged in negative 2 and got a number out. So there's definitely not, it's, the function is defined at negative 2. Okay. Um, I can see just looking at it, there's, there are going to be some x values that make this undefined or not in the domain, but they're not, it's not negative 2. Okay. I'd have to do a little work and set it up an inequality and look at uh, 4 x squared minus 3, when is this uh, less than 0? And the short answer is certainly when x is 0, it'll be negative. And x close to 0 will also be negative. Because it's a, the first part is positive always, and then minus 3. So there'll be small x values this will be negative for. And exactly how small, I'd have to do a little bit of work to figure out exactly how small. All right, so there is a polynomial. Now, rational functions, a little bit more tricky. So there was our polynomial. So we'll go with rational functions. So we already have p as a polynomial. Uh, we'll let q, q of x be a polynomial. So our rational function limit. will 
be P of C divided by Q of C. Now, I have to be a little more careful here. What additional thing do I have to watch out for? Q of, Q of Z better not be zero. So this is true when Q of C is not zero. So far, the limit laws are super easy. So what type of question do you think I'm going to put on your quiz? Mm -hmm. No. no. Well, maybe on your quiz. But everybody else is going to get one that's tougher. So we're going to spend a lot of our time looking at uh, limits that don't follow the easy limit laws. If it follows the easy limit law, you basically just plug in the number. No problem. So we're going to look at ones that are not easy. So let's do an easy one to build confidence, and then one that's not. All right, find this limit. It should be very easy. So we should get zero. Any questions on this one? What would be a bad x value to ask the same, I'm going to use the same fraction, the same function here, but what's a bad x value to approach? Oh, let's go with the approach one. There's another bad x value. What's the other bad x value? Negative one. Negative one. So we'll just go for one of them. All right, so try to apply the rational function limit law, and then tell me why it's not going to work. So we do get 0 over 0. Which 0 is the bad 0? One on the bottom. One on the bottom. One on the top is no problem. So that's the bad 0 down there. It's tempting to write undefined. Zero divided by zero, usually we write undefined. However, what did I say about the limit and x actually being equal to one? Is that relevant in the limit? No. Sure isn't. So first of all, I can't use the rational function rule because I'll be divided by zero. So that rule's out. So another thing we have to keep in mind x is close to, but not equal to 1. So x is close to, but not equal to 1. So I'm going to cross all this stuff out. It's not relevant. Can't use that law. So I better not be applying it. So you know some algebra. What algebra moves can you make on this uh, x squared minus 3x plus 2. Factor. So go ahead and factor the numerator, factor the denominator. Do that right now. And do it off to the side.
So are there any algebra questions on what's on the board? Which equal sign is not actually equal for all x values? The second one. So let's look carefully right here. What x value are they not equal? So I don't look at the one on the left, just these two right here. What x value are they not equal for? You've been writing that they're equal for years. So x is 1, they're, you get undefined on the left, and you get negative 1 half on the right. Those are definitely not equal. So they're the same thing when x is not 1. So when x is not 1, they're the same. Well, let's look at our limit now. What x value do we not have to consider at all? 1. So the fact that these expressions we just wrote down are equal, as long as x isn't 1, that's perfect. x is not going to be 1. So we're going to use this equality because we're not going to have x equaling 1. x is going to be close to 1, but not equal to 1. So now I can use this, x minus 2 over x plus 1. So we said they're equal as long as x is not 1, but good news is x is not 1 here. We're taking a limit, x is going to be close to 1, but not equal to 1. So what I did was completely OK. The single value that's not equal, well, we're not going to be concerned with that value. Will I be divided by 0 if I use our rational function limit law now? Nope. So go ahead and apply it. Tell me the answer. So you should get negative 1 half. That is our limit. What would you do if you did use negative 1? I would do exactly the, I would do exactly the same thing, except in this case, so let's do that problem actually. Let's think about approaching negative 1. So we'll say that's negative 1 right there. We need to approach negative 1 on both sides. We wrote an equality over here. We said they're equal when x is not positive 1. So there's positive 1. We're definitely not equal to positive 1, but not only that, we're not even close to positive 1. So we want to think about, well, what happens when x is super close to negative 1? So we're pretty far away from positive 1. So I don't have to worry about uh, x equaling 1. So I can use that, what we just did, that algebra, to simplify this down. So I'm going to use the exact same algebra we just did. And we got x minus 2 over x plus 1. So now we get minus 3 over 0. So this is a good time to talk about which undefined can you actually figure out the value for. You have a chance at 0 over 0. You don't have a chance at not 0 over 0. So we'll be looking at this one right here much more closely. So when you have non-0 over 0, it's not going to reduce down. So it's not going to turn into a nice number. So 
so it won't reduce. Uh, we're going to do some work, and we're either going to get minus infinity or plus infinity, or does not exist. And we're going to be lazy, and we'll use DNE for does not exist. So in order to figure out which of those three it's going to be, it takes a little more work. So at this point, it's probably best to just do a really, really fast graph of this function. So I can do a fast graph of So what are some properties I need to graph this function? It's like five properties at least that I can think of. What are some properties you need to graph? Could do slope. Let's go way back to pre-calculus before we had words like well, we still use slope there. All right, how about x-intercepts, y-intercepts, vertical asymptotes, end behavior, and whether it's crossing or bouncing at x and y-intercepts. So if I get x-intercepts, set 0 equal to the function, what x value do we get? That's for a y-intercept. How about x equals 2 as a solution? Are you guys doing OK? So this is graphing. We're finding intercepts, vertical asymptotes, end behavior. So we got 2, 0 is our x-intercept. Our y-intercept, you do the opposite. You set y equal to 0. No, x equals to 0. So you're going to take 0 and f it, and we get 0 minus 2 over 0 plus 1, which is two, negative 2. Negative 2. Where's our vertical asymptote? x equals negative 1. End behavior. So you look at the high powers of x. So we have y equals, I don't care about the minus 2 and the plus 1 for end behavior. So I just have x over x, and that reduces to 1. y equals 1. So draw your cloud, you get y equals 1. We have a cross uh, x-intercept, and we have a cross vertical asymptote. So that's what our function is going to look like. Hopefully this turned on the light bulb somewhere in your pre-calculus brain. Maybe not. We'll be doing graphing again. Now, x equals negative 1 is where this vertical line, the vertical asymptote is happening. So if I asked you, well, what's happening? So here's negative 1. What's happening if I approach negative 1 from negative land, from the left? What's happening to the y value? Approaching infinity. Positive infinity. What's happening if we approach negative 1 on the right side? What happens to the y value? Approaching negative infinity. Negative infinity. So from the graph, I could write down lim f of x, x approaches negative 1. Now it's a little bit strange, but negative 1 from the negative side. So you've got negative 1, and then you put a negative up in the exponent. So that's negative 1 from the left. I should say from, from the left. No, from the left. And we said that was positive infinity lim x approaches negative 1 from positive land from the right. And we said that was down here negative infinity. 
because they don't match, the limit doesn't uh, match up, so it does not exist. And we'll talk about that very soon. Well, they'd, if they were equal, then I could say the limit is the same thing they both are. But they don't match, so the two-sided limit or the regular limit doesn't exist because they have two different values. And you can see in the graph, they definitely don't match up. Like, this is probably the most extreme example of them not matching up because they're infinitely far away. On the homeworks, it might help some people. Um, sometimes, like, it doesn't matter per question. You have to put in DNA. Oh. Um, oh, that's not good. Yeah, Spelling so out none? Huh? Spelling out none? Yeah. And it's just random, like sometimes you have to put in none and sometimes you put in DNA. So I'll write that here. DNE does not exist. Sometimes you're going to see none. No. The standard one is does not exist. That's what, I'm pretty sure that's what your textbook says. So next theorem we're going to look at is the sandwich theorem. I learned it as a squeeze theorem. It's much better to think about if you're hungry especially. So we'll draw a picture to get some intuition and then we'll look at what's actually uh, the details of the theorem. Top function is actually going to be called h of x. So our crazy function is going to be called f of x. So if you have this inequality, you know that g is the smallest function, f is in between uh, g, and h is the big function. So you can think of this as the Goldilocks theorem. So you got a cold, medium, and hot function. g is going to be a smaller function, h is a bigger function, and f might be a crazy function. So if you're sure that g and h bound f then what we can say lim uh, x approaches c g of x is less than or equal to lim x approaches c f of x less than or equal to lim x approaches c h of x. So we call it the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem because the limits, the limit of f is squeezed between the two limits, limits of g and limits of h. 
So you got where the circle of overlap kind of for the for the functions with your diagram you've drawn before with limits and everything. Uh, it's what the domain can be for each. Well, so it doesn't need to be true. Something you know they may switch places over here, for example. So when I say close to C, I just mean it's some open interval around C. Okay. Um, they're ordered like H is the big one, F is smaller, and, and then G is the smallest. Okay. So um, if you want to get very technical, I mean, I would just say for X close to C, but if you want to be correct, you would say there exists an open interval containing C such that all X's in the interval have this property that I wrote down. So we'll just say for x close to c. Um, a lot of times you would go and you would make a, um, a delta neighborhood, which we'll see very soon, right there, an epsilon neighborhood. And then you would say all values that are within this small distance away from c. So let's talk about theorems. So I just wrote the words if, then. So let's talk about how theorems work. Most of them are going to look like if A, then B. So if some thing is happening, some statement A is true, then you know statement B is true. What's well, a statement? Statement is something that's either true or false. Uh, so what's a non-statement? Um, I'm a nice guy. That's an opinion. It's not true or false. Some people say yes, some people say no. But the truth is, there is no truth to that statement. If A, then B. So we get even lazier, and we can't be bothered to write those six letters. So a lot of times we just write A, and then we made a special arrow. It's a double arrow. A then B. This double arrow will mean implies. So if you know A is true, then B has to be true. Uh, where it gets more tricky, if, you, if you're not sure if A is true or not, you can't apply your theorem whatsoever. And knowing that B is true doesn't really tell you anything about A. So I'll give you a good example. So our hypothesis or our premise or our supposition is I get food poisoning. What does that imply if you get food poisoning? Probably you're going to vomit, maybe something else. But probably at least that. If it's real food poisoning, that's usually how it ends. Unless it's really, really bad, it can end other ways. But generally, it ends that way. All right, so what happens if you know for sure that I ate some uh, seven-layer dip that had some bad bacteria in it? And you know for sure that I got food poisoning. Yep, I'm either going to vomit or I just did, one of the two. So either way, part B is definitely going to happen. What happens if uh, I eat food and you have no idea if it has bacteria in it? So we don't know if I have food poisoning or not. What can you say about the conclusion? It may or may not happen. Yeah, it can go either way, right? Who knows? But the theorem is not applicable, is the point. So that's, if you know A is true, you know B is true. If you don't know whether A is true, you can't say anything. This theorem doesn't help you at all. Let's look at just B. If you know that I vomited, do you necessarily know I had food poisoning? Were you seasick? May have been seasick. May have partied too hard for New Year's. Maybe my 21st birthday. My 15th, 21st birthday. All right, so there's lots of other ways you can get to B. You just get regular sick, right? The flu, that could put you there. So there's lots of ways to get to B. So just because you know B is happening, you can't then go and say, oh, well, definitely he got food poisoning. Maybe, maybe not. 
What happens if I told you I haven't vomited for two years? Can you use this theorem? No. Think about it. For, for sure you know that I haven't vomited in two years. Certainly could change, but... Yeah, I definitely didn't get food poisoning, because if I did, that I, I, I wouldn't have gone two years without vomiting if I got real food poisoning. So that's what we call the contrapositive. And we're not going to go over that too much detail, but just know that you have to show your A is true, show your hypothesis is true, and then you can use the conclusion. So that's how you're going to be using theorems. So you have to show that A, which is the hypothesis, is true. Then you know that B, the conclusion, must be true. So the theorems we're going to use, you're going to have to show that A is true, show that A is happening, and then you can use the theorem. So you tell me, oh, about the sandwich theorem, this is my conclusion. So you show me A is true, and that means your uh, conclusion must also be true. So I want to warn you, if you're probably a lot of you are into science, hypothesis in science is not the same as hypothesis in math. So hypothesis in science what is that, something like uh, your educated guess on what most likely will happen, what you're predicting. So we're not predicting things here. We know if you know A is true, B is always true. So science uh, hypothesis are things that uh, appear to be true a vast majority of the time. So it's a little quite different in science. Uh, in stats? So yeah, in pretty much every science, there's like, oh, this we're 99.8 percent sure this thing is true. Well, we're not. We're 100 percent sure th that all of our theorems are correct. So you don't have to worry about, well, what about this? So they will always work out as long as you're sure that the hypothesis is satisfied. So let's go ahead and use this. Oh, my old one was if Chris has food, then Chris is happy. That's a good one, too. Not in math, no. Well, in science, nothing is 100% true. We just have made 10,000 observations, and they all appear. Like, we don't know the sun's going to rise tomorrow, but we can hypothesize that it will. At some point, it won't rise. Probably not in our lifetime, but at some point, it's going to explode. Yay. Don't tell it to somebody who's too young. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Everybody you know will be dead by then, including yourself. All right. Too much too soon. All right. Something you need to learn in high school. It would look neat. I think it would get cold very quickly, though. If you think about it, it will. Because someone will be looking at the horizon when it goes off. Well, that's a very serious assumption that somebody oh. will be around. Cockroaches will see it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a more safe assumption. So we're going to do two examples here. So we'll look at uh, the sine x function. Probably the best way to do this with a graph. So see if you can recreate the graph of sine. Let's go negative pi to positive pi. We don't need a graph more than that. 
we really just want what happens close to zero. So I think negative pi to positive pi is pretty easy to graph for sine. You need one and negative one. All right, there is one period of sine uh, close to zero. Usually we draw this period of sine from zero to two pi. That might look more familiar, but I want to look at both sides of zero, not just the positive side of zero. All right, anybody brave want to tell me limit of sine when x approaches zero from the graph? So I want to know limit x as x approaches zero. What happens as x approaches zero? What does f of x approach? Zero. 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 So that's pretty easy to see on the graph. All right, so that one was easy. Just look at the graph, no problem. So last example of the day. So we have a product here, limit of x times sine 1 over x. What happens if you plug in 0 into sine 1 over x? We got undefined. So good news is our limit is close to 0 but not equal to 0. Bad news is I can't just plug the 0 in. I'll get undefined. So we just used, or we just talked about the sandwich theorem. If you get a small, medium, large function lined up nicely. So let's go ahead and line up. So first of all, what part of this is crazy? Is the x crazy or the sine 1 over x? Sine 1 over x. Sine 1 over x is the crazy part. x is not very crazy. So let's look at sine 1 over x. What I need are a smaller function, and I have sine over 1 over x is in the middle, and then a big function. No matter what x is, there are two numbers you can put here that will always be true. There's actually infinite correct answers, but what are the best two numbers? What's the biggest sign we'll ever get? One. No matter what, sign's not going to pass one. We know it's on the unit circle, never going to have bigger x value than one. So I can say for sure, one over there. Negative one? And that's, the other bound's going to be negative one. So never going to go past negative one. Wherever you go on the unit circle, the lowest your y value is ever going to be is negative 1. Now, unfortunately, that's not the function we started with. We started with x times sine 1 over x. So I'm going to multiply x into here. So I'm going to take our inequality and multiply by x. So I just did some very naughty math. What did I assume about x? It was positive. That it was positive. How do you know I assumed it was positive? It the same. So I didn't flip my inequalities around. What happens if x is negative? All the inequalities are going to get turned around. So let's. So this is if. So we go here. If x is greater than or equal to zero, we'll write a second inequality will be for x not greater than 0, for x less than 0. We need to flip all of our inequalities. So the, the sign for the negative x would not change as well, even though it's multiplied by another negative? Because it started with negative 1, so if x was negative, wouldn't negative 1 times negative whatever x is? make that positive? Or does that not work for inequalities? No, it works. So negative 1 times x is negative x, right? Right. You're thinking too much worrying about, well, if x is negative, if x is negative, then negative x is positive. Right. 
So it's a little strange. If x is negative, this is actually this part right here is actually a positive value. Okay. That's a little strange. And then if x is negative, this one's actually a negative value. That's a little strange. Okay. To a degree, we did not really flip the points. Flip so we're going to fix this with absolute values. So negative x, if x is already negative, negative x is positive. Now, if x is negative, I could write negative x, or I could write, we know x is negative, so if I take the absolute value and put a negative in front, it won't change values. So that's a little bit tricky right there, what I did. It's strange because you have to remember x is negative with everything that's on the board right now. So if x is less than 0, that means I could write x as absolute value of x with a negative in front if x is negative. So that's what I did right here on the left side. And I did basically did the exact same thing on the right side. I just multiplied that by negative 1. So absolute value of x is actually negative x. So any questions on that? That's a little bit tricky. So now I'm going to write the inequality the way it should be written. You go small, medium, large. So do we need both of those or just this one? Well, we're about to look at the original one. All right, in the original one, x was positive already. So I can put absolute value signs around x and not change anything. x is already positive, so absolute value won't change anything. So good news is we get the exact same inequality whether x is positive or negative. We get the exact same thing. That was a little bit tricky to set up with x being positive or negative. But as long as you're careful with uh, what I wrote down here, x is negative. So that means x is negative absolute value of x. It's a little bit harder to think about, but you should be able to convince yourself that's true. And then I just made a couple substitutions as I went down. Yes, sir? Oh, it'll be negative sometimes, positive other times, for sure. Uh, but remember, the inequalities we wrote down are going to be true regardless. So it might be negative, it might be positive. So we'll finish this. It's basically sandwich theorem. We're going to take limits of the outsides. Those will have nice limits. And then the limit of the inside will be in between. It is, but I wanted them to match exactly. I wanted to, oh, no matter if x is positive or negative, this is our inequality. So I didn't want to have to like, do one problem if x is positive and a different problem if x was negative. <laughs>